Okay, I think we can go ahead and get started. Good morning, good evening, and afternoon from wherever in the world you're joining us today. And a very happy new year to all of the people on this call. Welcome to this year's first Spunko webinar. Today's speaker is Aditi Seshadri. She's a serial entrepreneur, specifically the co-founder and a partner of Unlocking Impact. It is my greatest pleasure to welcome Aditi to talk about social impact. Just a side note, Q&A will be done after her presentation through the chat feature. Spunko is an all-girls global student organization where proceeds go to charity. And with that, the floor is now yours, Aditi. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I want to echo, um, you know, what uh, uh, what Neetra just said, which is that um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. A bunch of you are joining us from uh, different places, so that's really nice. And I'm so excited and honored to be here because um, I've been following Spunko's work and um, I love what you're doing. So I'm very honored. It means a lot to me to be a part of this community and you know have a chance to share my story. Um, people often talk about, um, just give me a second, I'm going to share screen. Um, like many talks, there will be a few slides that I will be sharing, but hopefully nothing that will kind of uh, you know be too heavy for you. Um, people often talk about what they did right when they, you know, with respect to their journey, right? Whether whatever their achievements are, their professional journey, their career, what other things that they did. But I wanted to actually spend a little bit of time today talking about what I did wrong. So not the things that I did right, but actually the things that I did wrong, um, what I like to call don't do what I did, right? Uh, and I think that's something that's uh, it's something that's always you know been important to me to talk about what are the mistakes you make so therefore the mistakes that i've made and what i learned from them my name is aditi seshadri uh, i am co-founder and partner at a, a business and a company called unlock impact we are uh, one of the few women owned women led social ventures uh, we work at the intersection of gender climate and social enterprise we provide employment to women uh, through our model called the Comms Ninja model, which offers storytelling and communications and marketing services to social impact organizations. We also run a network called the Nushu Network, which helps uh, women entrepreneurs all over Asia. Hopefully many of you will someday be a part of that, uh, called the Nushu Network, which actually helps women entrepreneurs scale and grow their businesses. Um, in the 20 years of my career, I've been I had to calculate today and I realized I have to, it's actually almost, I've been working for almost 21 years. I don't know where the time flew, but in the 20 plus years of my career, um, I've been a journalist. I started off my uh, career as a journalist. I've been a marketing and communications professional, um, both in the impact and non-impact space. And then I said, you know, life is too easy. Um, it's, you know, it's pretty chill, whatever. So let me complicate it and make it harder. And that's when I decided to become an entrepreneur. And there's really been no looking back from that. And I thought this, you know, this image really describes uh, what being an entrepreneur is like. A lot of the times, every day is different. Sometimes it's exciting. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes you wonder what the hell you're doing. Uh, but having said that, I have been an entrepreneur now for uh, nearly seven years. Um, and I'm very happy to be where I am today. Um so made a lot of mistakes. All of us make a lot of mistakes, right? It's nothing new. Uh, we'll find a lot of material, a lot of books, a lot of talks about this. Uh, my journey or what I'm going to talk about today is rooted in my journey and some specific things that I've kind of been through and, you know, uh, hopefully learned something from that I can share with you. So I've made a lot of mistakes, of course. Um, some are easy. Some are quick to move on from, you know, you um, two days ago, I bought a dress online. It arrived, I realized it's the wrong size, uh, so I had to return it. It was very easy, it was no fuss, at absolutely no cost. So no problem, that's not a problem at all. Easy, easy mistake to kind of solve, right? But some stay with you a bit more, and um, I'm going to spend, of course, today talking about a little bit more about that. So this is me <laughs> at age 16, 17. Um, I was, um, I think, I, I, I'm... I, I, I was trying, I was actually going through some photo albums. I can't remember exactly which year this was, but this is definitely as I was finishing school. Uh, I'm on a holiday actually with my family and I'm just about finishing school, thinking about going into college. Um, I was really keen at that time on studying English literature. I've always loved books. I was a total bookworm growing up. Um, 
you know, I would spend a lot of time, um, like I could always get, you know, I had a, an, like I was that kid. I had a library membership. I still have a library membership and I would go and like pick up tons of books and read them. So for me, um, going into college, um, I thought, you know, studying English literature was like the dream, right? So it's like how, you know, you get to go to college, you can read books and then you discuss those books. And basically, like I had this, you know, image in my imagination, it was just this like wonderful life where I'd be sitting and reading books and discussing them all day long, right? Um, and I'd always wanted to do that. And also it was a pathway for me for what I thought I wanted to do later on, which was to become a journalist. Um, so this is something that I had, you know, thought thought about right through high school. And I was pretty sure that I was this is this is what I was going to do. However, as I got into the whole, the whole admission process, um, I realized that it's going to be harder than I thought. Uh, my grades were good. I mean, I wasn't, a, I wasn't, I was never a sort of uh, overachiever. I was not an underachiever. I was as, as the, you know, I was above average. So I had decent grades, but not great grades. And um, some point into the admission process, I started worrying that I was not going to get into, you know, I wasn't going to get into the course and the college that I wanted. I started panicking and I was worried about what would happen. Like, oh my God, like if I don't get this admission, what's going to happen? Is my whole future going to be determined by this? Uh, in India, especially, there is this perception that um, if you, you know, if you're studying arts, the arts or literature, um, it's not going to help you get jobs. It's for really for either, and you know, there is there is a reason, of course, behind these perceptions, but it's really for it's 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 not they're not job oriented courses. And if you want safety and security as a developing at that time, developing nation, continuing to develop nation security, financial security, of course, is important to uh, most people. Um, so the perception, however, was that if you did one of these courses, you wouldn't get a job, right? Like, what are you going to do after that? Are you going to be a writer? Like, or are you going to teach? Um, so I changed my mind and I decided that I would apply for an accounting course instead. It seems sensible. Uh, people always need accountants and, um, Seemed like, okay, I will at least have like the guarantee of a job after that, right? So in theory, I studied accounting for three years. I have a bachelor's in commerce. I have studied all types of accounting, um, uh, you know, cost accounting, management accounting, income tax accounting. I studied all of that for three years. Uh, but the reality was that I was barely in class uh, any of that, uh, any of those years. I was, I was always mostly found outside of class. I threw myself into college extracurriculars. I participated in every possible extracurricular activity, you know, drama, theater, music, everything. I uh, was a member of the student council, uh, but basically I was never in class. To this day, I have never, after I graduated, I have never balanced a balance sheet again. I think the last time I did that was for my final exam. And my sister actually is the one who helps me with my accounting. Uh, she studied economics and finance, and she actually helps me with my accounting. I do, however, still continue to read a lot of books and I discuss them all the time, right? So what is the mistake? So this is like a bit of background of where I started, right? I grew up in Chennai and this is, you know, this is kind of like the first sort of phase of my life. The mistake, I think, apart from the very obvious, I think, fashion choices over here, the 90s were not kind to uh, girls and women. But apart from the very obvious, uh, you know, fashion mistakes, what is the mistake that I feel I made now? Mistake number one, what I, I'm going to call is um, really not sticking to my convictions, right? And I think it's this, when you're 16, every it's, it, it is hard because you know so little and there are a lot of people around you um, who, of course, have more life experience and all of those kind of things. But I did, in fact, even then know what I really wanted to do, but I didn't have the courage to stick to my convictions, right? And it's it's something that I think is true whether you're 16 it is harder to do. It takes a lot more courage at 16. It's a lot easier, you know, 20 years later, uh, 25 years later. But if I had to say this to anybody else today, I would be like, don't make that mistake. If you know, even when something is hard, uh, like, you know, going through the admission process at that time, I mean, at that time, it, it seemed hard. Now I know that, you know, it's, 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 it's the benefit of age and experience, right? But also it was hard to kind of stick to something when, you know, everybody around you is telling you something different. But even if you're 16, 17 years old, if you know what's, you know, you know, when you know, you know. And um, that's really sort of my first, um, the first piece that I wanted to talk about, which is that mistakes that I've made and what I've learned from them is this, that, you know, sticking to your convictions, I think at any stage or age in life is like super important. So 
just a little bit about the first, you know, I'm I'm kind of going, as you can see, I'm kind of going through a journey. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, sort of the next phase of my life, which is um, after college. So I did, like I said, I, I did go on to study, uh, uh, you know, I, I mean, of course, I, I studied accounting, but after that, I did go actually back to, you know, um, the original plan, which was to become a journalist. So I studied media and communications. Um, I did my post-graduation uh, post in media and communications. I moved cities. I moved to a new city. I moved, if you're familiar with India, I moved to Bombay, which is one of the busiest, hectic, most exciting cities in India. So I moved there at age 20 to study uh, media and communications and then went on to become a journalist um, at age 21, right? Uh, and um, at that time, I worked, I became a print journalist, which meant something at that time when everything had not gone digital. Uh, so for many of you, may, I don't know, I, I believe the age group is quite vast here. So there are probably many of you who are like, hmm, what is a newspaper, right? But uh, I did actually work in newspapers at that time. And um, it was exciting. I loved being part of a newsroom. Uh, it was really exciting to be part of the big events of the day um, in whatever small way, right? So I used to be a sub editor and a reporter. So I would actually be part of the team that would put the paper together at the end of the, you know, all day, all of this, all of this stuff would be happening. And then in the last few hours in the night is when the paper would go to bed. So I would actually be part of the team that would help to kind of select, you know, what are going to be the big stories of the day, who should read what, how do we plan all of this together? So it used to be quite like, exhilarating to kind of you know plan that and think about like what are people going to read and shape what people are going to read and think the next day so I used to actually you know I moved to Bombay and I lived with uh I lived with my uh you know I had a few flatmates and uh you know we're friends to this day I think some of those bonds that happened at that stage in life I think they stay really long so we're friends to this day but my friend and flatmate would call me every night and she'd be like, uh, you know, what's tomorrow's headline? And there's just something so exciting about that, right? Like being like being able to tell somebody what tomorrow's news is. So, but after a few years, I, you know, I kind of lost my way a little bit. Um, one day, and it, 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 there was a path, like I spent a few years in uh, newspapers and I moved on to magazines. I moved cities, you know, I, sp I wanted to do more writing. So I spent more time writing. But I kind of, I do feel like I lost track, like, right? Like you just kind of go with the flow and, you know, I, I felt like I'd lost my way a little bit. I realized this one day because I was, um, I was, I suddenly found myself at a wedding talking to a bride-to-be about her makeup tutorial and technique, right? And I thought to myself, like, I'm like, what am I doing? You know, I, this is not, this is not something that I care about. Don't get me wrong. I have no, absolutely no issues with, um, you know, the subject of bridal makeup, you know, there is a space for all of that. It's just that it wasn't for me. So I was kind of wondering like how, you know, I'm, this is not how I want to spend my time, right? Like what uh, I did, I, I, and I, by this time I was about 27, I think. Um, and I did have this realization that I knew I was going to spend a chunk of my life working. And I had this inkling that if I wanted to spend part of my life working, it had to be work that really mattered at a personal level and an ideological level. It was not, you know, it was not enough to work for the sake of work. Uh, again, it's, you know, it's required. Many people need to do that. It was just that I was sure it was not my, it's, it was not It was not the way I was going to do this. Um, so yes, I have to pay bills and, you know, I had to like, I had to pay rent, I had to pay bills, I have responsibilities, uh, you know, I have a family, but uh, I did know that even that was not enough to kind of do something just for, personal just you know just just for the sake of making money or you know not that there's anything wrong with that but I knew it had to have some more ideological uh, purpose to it so um I started kind of exploring what my options were out there journalism had changed a lot by then and I think one of the big realizations was that even though I spent like a better part of my childhood thinking I'm going to be a journalist uh I actually I don't think I really had the skill sets for it there are great journalists in the world today um I don't think I was going to be one of those. It was just not, it, it was something that I, I loved the idea of. But once I started doing it, I realized that maybe I don't have what it takes, right? But I still wanted to do work that mattered. So I, you know, I started kind of exploring and I, I decided to move into the social sector. Like I said, I was around 27 at that time and I'd already been working for about maybe six or seven years. So I thought it would be a breeze. I thought it'd be very easy to find jobs and um, it's like, you know, the, uh, the, the the thing of your 20s, you know, you're like, I'm so awesome. Like people would be so lucky to have me and I already have this experience and stuff. 
not so much, right? <laughs> The social sector was very different from what I was used to. I had worked in a very thriving, vibrant uh, environment where um, a lot of your previous background didn't matter. Um, media, journalism is the kind of space and which is why a lot of people gravitate towards it, right? Because it really is about doing on the job. Uh, you could have the best credentials, could have gone to the best colleges, but uh, you, know, you could even know people to get your first job. But after a while, uh, really how you report, like your actual skill sets on ground are what matter, uh, which is true, of course, of most industries and careers. But like, you know, the social sector was a bit different from what I was used to. It was very tightly knit. And uh, a lot of it, uh, in a lot of places, you needed really strong academic credentials. Uh, I didn't have that. You know, I didn't have like an MS, you know, in social work. I didn't have a PhD. I had not spent my time researching and not worked in like grassroots organizations. Um, so everyone else, it also seemed like everyone was speaking a certain language that I didn't even know, right? Like I didn't know these terms and things like that. So for a few years, I got totally stuck. Um, and, you know, I, I think there was about a period of, and stuck in different ways, stuck in terms of like um, uh, my professional growth. So I wasn't, I wasn't moving, I wasn't learning. And also because of that, I was stuck also in terms of like my monetary growth, right? Like my sta salary stayed the same for like five years. I, you know, I didn't see a raise. I didn't see anything because I was just trying to, you know, keep figuring out what I needed to do. Um, I think there was a period I was counting back. And I think there was a period of about one, one and a half years when I must have done about 12 or 13 job interviews, which were multiple rounds of like, you know, uh, uh, written tests, uh, multiple rounds of interviews, and I would, you know, keep progressing, but I would never actually land the job, right? And it was quite difficult. Um, it was, it, it kind of like burst my little confidence bubble a little bit and made me wonder, you know, um, was I actually, you know, capable of any of this, right? So, I mean, what was the mistake? Um, not the fact, again, not the fact that I chose to switch careers. I think the mistake number two is um, not asking for help. So when I think back now, I think um, I think this was the thing that I, I should have done at that time. If I reached out to people with relevant connections or experience, I would have saved myself a lot of time and a lot of angst. Um, I think I would have also found like, you know, connections and mentors who would actually would have guided me on what are the right steps, what who to talk to, where to go. And like sometimes you just need a bit of a boost, right? It's not favors. It's just asking for help. Uh, sometimes someone will just open up something and maybe they'll just give you like a piece of advice or maybe they'll even just make a connection. And it's such a simple thing to do to ask for help. But I think I was too, I floundered on my own for way too long. Um, I think I, I, there was probably a bit of ego involved. I felt like I already knew a lot of stuff. So, you know, and I think there was a lot of embarrassment involved as well, because at that time I didn't really, like, I was feeling a bit like, oh, you know, I seem very lost. So I'm embarrassed to, you know, to kind of show this, show this vulnerability to people, right? I don't want them to see or feel like I'm clueless, um, you know, when asking for help might, might come across as that. But I would say time and again, you know, don't make that mis mistake, ask for help and ask for help like that, right? Like ask easily, quickly, constantly, always ask for help because I've, I've seen now that, you know, people can be quite generous. And I've been on the other side of things now. People ask me for help and it's it's just so easy. It's just sometimes it's just an email, it's a call, it's just a very quick thing. And people are actually a lot of are very generous with all of this. And I think it might just get you to your goal faster and definitely with a lot more joy and happiness, right? Without the kind of angst that you might go through otherwise. Anyway, I kept at it. I didn't do this at the time, but I kept at it. And eventually, I, you know, kind of got a little unstuck. Um, and things started to move forward. And I made my, at that time, first career transition. Um, I've now been working in social impact for, it's going to be 14 years this year. And so far, so good. No existential crisis yet. So I think, I'm, you know, I'm pretty happy to be where I am today. Which brings me to sort of, you know, um, the third and current phase of my life, which is, you know, um, where I am now an entrepreneur. I run this business called Unlock Impact, as I said at the start, and I run it with my co-founder and friend. That's the two of us over there. Uh, one of the best things about running a company with, you know, with women and, you know, by women is that it involves a lot of face facts. Uh, <laughs> but there is, uh, but jokes aside, it is like, there is, of course, like a sense of bonding and community over this. So this is us actually um, brainstorming. And this was like a, one of our, like, this was our strategy meeting last year. 
uh, you know, where we were kind of figuring out, you know, sort of the next phase, you know, what we want to do with the business. I live in Goa, which is a small seaside town in uh, India on the West Coast. And Priya, my business partner over there, lives in the Philippines in Manila. And we actually run our business across two regions. We run it virtually, remotely. We were actually, oddly enough, virtual, remote, all of those kind of things, even pre-pandemic, even when we started our business. Uh, by just, you know, it happened very organically because we lived in two different countries, but we were like, that shouldn't stop us from starting and running a business together. So um, in one sense, we were actually pretty lucky when the pandemic hit that it didn't really affect how we would function. Uh, but, you know, if right from the start, we were like, this is this is the reality. We live in different places, but we really want to work together. Uh, so we, we're going to do this and we'll somehow make it work, right? So if you'd asked me 20 years ago, uh, you know, when I talk about that sort of, you know, the writer becoming journalist and, you know, marketing and all of those kind of things, I would have not in a million worlds would I have imagined that I would be an entrepreneur where I am today. Yesterday, I was looking at spreadsheets and sales targets. I have never done that in my life before. On Thursday, I was working on a proposal to send to like a CSR, a corporate social responsibility foundation. On Tuesday, I was onboarding new hires. Uh, literally every day is different and I, I actually do love it most of the time sometimes it's a little hard but most of the time I actually do love it so what's the mistake here right I the mistake is definitely not starting a business um, it like I said it's been six years and I think you know um, it's going to be almost seven years so I know that the, that's not the mistake I would say this that the mistake mistake number three um, is probably that I didn't dream big enough at the start so so this is one of those intangible things, right? Like what is dreaming big? Um, is starting a business itself, of course, is, is a big dream. I mean, not a lot of people have the appetite for it, again, which is fine. And also maybe not a lot of people have the circumstances and professional person circumstances that allow them to start a business. Having said that, it does take a bit of a risk appetite to become an entrepreneur. Um, so what is, you know, so is that big? Is that big enough? What is dreaming big? Is dreaming big just deciding to do something? or when you're doing something, deciding to like go bigger, you know, what really it's, it's very, it's very, it can be very intangible, right? So here, what I mean, again, with, again, from my own perspective, and my experience is that not setting yourself up, like, so when you're starting out, not doing it with limitations at the start, right? So not, not setting these limitations in your mind or for yourself at the start. So if I take my own example, yes, I wanted to be independent and I and start a business. I think by the time I got to this point, I knew that, you know, that was going to, I, I was pretty sure that that was going to be the next phase. Like I said, it, it is scary. It does take a bit of a risk, you know, appetite. But I told myself, let's start small, you know, let's see how it goes. Let's start small. Let's maybe not put too much money into it. Let's see how it will work out. Yes, these are very practical considerations. Um, not everybody can, you know, be like, okay, I'm just going to put all my money into it. However, I do think that as women, we always, and I say this as a woman, um, I, you know, we often set mental boundaries to protect uh, protect ourselves because we know that there are bigger barriers and there is a harsh world out there, right? So when I tell myself, okay, let me start a business, but let's keep it small. Yes, there is a bit of a practical consideration that I don't want to lose money. However, now in retrospect, I think it was also this thing of like, I didn't want to fail at something, you know, that again, it shows it, it needs vulnerability. And I was like, I, I don't, can I do this? Right. Um, and so that itself was the dreaming, you know, at that stage itself, if, if the point, if, if I'm telling myself, you know what, I can, I, I can do this and I can go big then maybe something, you know, we would have done some things differently at the start. Right. And this is, I feel that this is true, not just, it, you don't have to be an entrepreneur or be running a business to experience this. Um, you know, you may be interested in politics, right? But you tell yourself that, okay, I'll teach political science, I'll study political science, I'll teach political science. But maybe you don't tell yourself that I can become a minister or a prime minister or a president. So that's setting the limitations at the start to prevent sort of future, you know, heartbreak or failure, right? Or you like to sing, you know, a lot of talented people out here, maybe you even like, maybe you like to sing. So you start a band, maybe you even do some concerts, but you don't tell yourself that, okay, I can be the next Taylor Swift. Why not? Maybe, you know, if Taylor Swift had not told herself that, would she be where she is today, right? So why the hell not? Because I think that's some of the, if we remove some of the mental barriers at the start, it actually does help, you know, to kind of combat because 
our job is to kind of do the dreaming other people might kind of work to you know to make the dreams not come true but if we ourselves do that then that's that's already one barrier that we've not crossed right so it doesn't and you know the best part, part is it doesn't really cost anything to dream and to dream really big because if you believe in it what i've seen is that if you believe in the big dream you're actually able to convince other people as well and they believe in it along with you so if i had believed you know that writers could make money and it's not accountants for example right like it's not just accountants who could make money writers could also make money or that it would be okay to put myself out there be vulnerable really get people to help me or that even a business that i started even though i knew nothing about running a business before could have been huge um i might be at a different place right now luckily i have learned so much from them so i don't have any regrets but i do know that i will never make the same mistakes again uh because that's something that i've learned from all of this right so um that's you know that, that sort of but i you know um so I, like i said i call this like you know the mistakes i've made and what i've learned from them but i do think um uh you know it's it's all fine to sort of very easy to give other people this advice and advice is cheap and you know all of that but um it's quite another thing to sort of follow it yourself right so i did want to spend the last few minutes maybe just talking a bit like uh, about okay yes these mistakes and while they may have happened over you know so sort of 20 years of my life and my professional and personal career um has what has changed have i actually or let me put this do i follow my own advice right um and i want to spend the last few minutes of what i'm of my talk today to maybe talk a little bit about that so just want to share a few examples of what what it means sometimes to follow you know these kind of when, when to follow this kind of advice so to go back to what i was saying at the start sticking to your convictions i it was difficult for me to stick to my convic convictions at age 16 uh i'm now 42 so it's been 25 years so hopefully 25 years <laughs> later there has been some learning and i think one of the big you know um examples of that that i wanted to share today is that earlier this year i so while i started my business um like i said nearly 7 years ago um for a few years i actually i i, I was doing like a double kind of thing i had a full time job and i was uh, building the business again trying to sort of you know figure out you know manage my finances as well because it's not easy it's it sounds very glamorous to say that you're an entrepreneur but the reality is is that it does take some time to become financially sustainable so in that time i also had a full time job uh but earlier last year in 2023 i finally sort of followed my conviction and said that if i really have to see where unlock impact goes and where my sort of you know journey goes as an entrepreneur i need to quit my job to focus on this full time So this is an example you know I wanted to share of uh, did I you know the advice that I'm happily dishing out today am I following it I am trying to follow it um and I did that did do that earlier this year by quitting my job to become a full time entrepreneur um there is a I think the advantage of sort of over time is that then there are caveats nothing is absolute um I would say this that if this is something you are you know if you're in this situation and your position in in life yes stick to your convictions but also i think it's important that sometimes to you know yes you follow through with your conviction convictions but it's also okay to course correct so what i told myself this time was around this time around was that i you know i believe in this i believe in this enterprise that i'm building so if i have to back it i need to do it full time however i i do understand that if in a few years time you know uh, because circumstances change market changes most most businesses fail that that is also okay so i should be willing to drop those assumptions that this will be a success at that point of time and course correct and then do what it needs to be uh, do do what needs to be done to go to the next phase of uh, of my life right so that is i think the you know yes you you know you you have that learning you make the mistake you have the learning but you also grow with it and that's what i would say you know would be different sort of this time around right um and so the second one so the second mistake asking for help I think this has been one of the biggest uh, I've it, it's always been a bit of a challenge for me to ask for help and I think this is I if if I had to look back at any kind of uh, you know personal growth arc in my life I would really say this is the biggest one uh, which is that really being able to ask people for help and I don't mean just professional help I think for personal and professional needs I think as human beings we are super socially connected people we are very community dri driven um and people like i said are very generous so for me personally this has actually been the biggest learning is to actually be able to go to people and ask for help 
not just professional help, but personal help as well. And I do it time and again, you know, on the professional side, like it's something as simple as like, you know, in the early days of running our business, we realized that we really needed to like, you know, have like a more professional, you know, someone professional look at our finances and look at our operations. So I literally went and asked my sister, the sister that I mentioned earlier, who does my accounting, I went and asked her for help. And, you know, she came on board like, you know, four years ago and she's still with us. And I think that was a big thing that's really helped us with the organization, right? But also on the personal front, there have been times, um, especially in the years when I was kind of doing, running the business and, um, you know, uh, working full time, um, I was really finding it very difficult to man maintain like balance in terms of like, you know, what I need and what needs to be done for work. So sometimes just asking friends for help uh, with um, uh, things that I needed help with, but also like, you know, asking my husband to like take care of help, you know, take care of the house because I'm like, I can't, I can't do this and that. So if I need to focus more on, you know, the professional aspect of my life right now, I need help on the personal side, which means that someone else does need to pick up the slack and cook more and take care of the house and all of those kind of things. People will do it. But the thing is, first thing is you need to ask them. Right. And I have found that, you know, um, if you ask, then the help does come. But like if, you know, put in the tip over here, just be clear about what is good help. What is help that is actually good for you? And what is something that is just, you know, that is it required for you or not? Just, you know, something to think about. Um, which really brings me to the sort of the final point, which is that dreaming big, right? Uh, this is the sort of larger question, um, more intangible kind of thing. And I think, you know, now I would say that, do I, you know, do we dream big? Yes, we do every single day. Um, last week I was, you know, with the same business partner, we were both, um, this was, we, we were doing our strategy session for this year. And, uh, we do this exercise, annual exercise every year where we kind of look back at the year and we then kind of plan for the year to come ahead. And, you know, we, we did a big strategy exercise. We have targets for the next three years and we're like, okay, this is what we're going to do. But what is also great every time is that we get to like, we look back at where we were, right? And it was really funny because, um, so this is 2024, but in 20, and you know, we started the business in 20, 2017, but as recently as 2021, um, the last time, you know, that time when we did our meet, we were actually this close to shutting down because we were just like, you know, it was, um, it was also, we were still in the pandemic and, you know, startup life is hard, uh, like I said, because you need to figure out financial sustainability, but also it takes a bit of time to figure out like what is working, what do people want? And as recently as 2021, uh, we were like, okay, you know what? We're going to give this one more year. And if it doesn't happen, then we're just going to take this call, you know, and I was recovering from COVID at that time. I was exhausted and I was just like, you know, maybe we're done, right? And then we look back, three years later, we look back at our numbers and we have grown like exponentially in that time. So, and I think one of the big things is that because we were just, every year we dream bigger and bigger and if you're you know and I don't mean just every year like every day we think about this so I think one big change that I have learned and I have taught myself to do is that to really believe that anything is possible and to dream really big do we want to build like a multi-million dollar business yes we do do we do we want to reach like thousands and thousands and thousands of women across the globe and really have like far-reaching impact absolutely and do we also want to have very rich and full lives that kind of bring all of this together? Yes. So there is no sort of limitation to that, right? And that's really what, um, I think that's really what makes all of this worth it. And I want to leave you finally with that idea that, you know, if you want to, you know, if you want to think about like how to sort of build your life and profession, uh, these are some of the things to think about. So on that note, thank you so much. Um, I hope you found uh, some of my stories and nuggets interesting. And um, yeah, happy to happy to chat and happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Aditi, for this refreshing take on entrepreneurship. We do want to hear you talk a little bit more. So we have a few questions here from the audience. Mm -hmm. So the first question is, what did your parents think of your sudden change from literature to accounting? <laughs> so... Um... In this case, I think it was it was the most sensible route. Uh, so to be fair, my parents were very supportive of everything that I I wanted to do at that time. So they were okay with. So actually, a lot of this came internally, uh, because I was getting more caught up in sort of the you know peer pressure and more societal kind of pressure. So they were always very supportive and encouraging of this. So they would have been okay with anything. Um, uh, they were surprised, but this was in one sense this was the most sensible route and the traditional route. So I guess it worked. 
in that, you know, it, it wasn't a shock or it wasn't a surprise to them. But I think, um, you know, it was, like I said, it was more of an internal, uh, sometimes we do that to ourselves, right? Like we create like this pressure around it. And there is, of course, uh, no doubt a lot of like peer pressure and societal pressure as well. Um, so it just seemed when things started to get difficult, it just seemed to make sense to take the more practical route. But um, all of this is, of course, possible also because, you know, you need that kind of, you know, home situation that supports you. Um, if, all, all of my sort of career, life, career, professional choices have I've been lucky uh, to maybe I've had I've had good role models and I've been make, able to make them independently. Um, but also you do need to kind of build that kind of support around you. Uh, people who believe in you, people who support you and people who think you can actually do this. Right. So so it's this if you're in a situation where your parents don't support a switch like this, and of course, it's much harder. Uh, but having said that, like I said, you know, um, do what I did in the second part, right? Stick to your convictions, follow through on it, but be willing to admit your mistake and course correct later on. So I would say that would be the way I would approach it now. I completely agree. A support system is probably a very, very important thing right about times when you're doing really big changes in your life. Yeah. yeah. The second question here is, can corporate journalism possibly help social impact, maybe even enhance it? Sure. So just, I mean, just to understand the term when, when you say corporate journalism, um, you know, um, I, I just want to make sure I understand the term correctly. So Melody, when you have a moment, please, uh, if you could just type in there, what do you mean by corporate journalism? I think just uh, the general sense of, you know, big media corporations um, versus small, probably independent businesses. So more on the... Okay. The former side, yeah. Okay. So, you know, there are um, there are multiple viewpoints on this uh, and it's a spectrum. So social impact is a spectrum. Um, there are, and also it's changed a lot, right? So there was a time, in, even in India, the perception, like maybe even 15 years ago. So when I first moved into the sector, you know, a lot of people would ask me like, oh, do you even get paid, right? Uh, because the idea was that it would it is a very volunteer driven thing. Um, that it is really for people who, and uh, understandably, uh, you know, that it's it, 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 that you can't make a career out of it. Um, so that is obviously that has changed a lot, but it is also a spectrum. So on one end, there are the really grassroots organizations that are doing amazing, like you know, uh, work with rural communities, with poor communities, with like you know, discriminated, marginalized communities, and there is that sort of spect one end of the spectrum. But then there is also the people who make that possible because they are able to fund it, right? Um, and though that is where a lot of, um, we still live in a world where the wealth is very, uh, it's unfairly distributed and it's very disparate. So what I've come to realize is that a lot of people in the middle of the spectrum are the ones who are able to sort of unlock that money so that it goes towards people who need it, right? So every one of those people and players and stakeholders is important. So while yes capitalism and what it stands for is problematic but you know what that you know um especially in india for example like in the last few years a lot of funding has been unlocked for the social sector because um there's been a ruling that you know uh, corporates have to actually donate a percentage of their net profits to corporate social responsibility so what this has done is that it's unlocked a lot of funding for you know people to really do very good uh, work at the grassroots level right so then what do you do so this is a this is a debate, right? So then does so if you removed all of these players, yes, in one sense, some of the world's problems wouldn't exist. Uh, but in the other sense, uh, it is also a cycle, right? Like all of this kind of feeds into each other. So that very long uh, convoluted answer to say that I think of uh, you, um, if you want to do like really sort of deep grassroots impact, I think, um, you know, you need to find the space for that. Um, what corporates have helped to do is that they have had to create a lot of awareness. Uh, unfortunately, small organizations don't have the kind of resources that would help this. Uh, large organizations do, so they have to create a lot of awareness. Uh, it, it's much easier for a corporate to run a campaign on, you know, uh, hunger and poverty, and it will reach a lot more people, and you know, than it would be for a smaller organization. And increasingly, a lot of people are thinking about business for good, right? So how can they actually shift? 
some of their thinking in a way that the business is actually helping and uh, create social good. So, so that's really where it is today. Um, at a personal level, I think it would it's it, what works for you. Um, if if ideologically, if you know, working for a corporate and what they do doesn't work for you, then don't do it. Um, working with grassroots organizations, very, very important. If that's what matters, then do that. We found our sort of pathway in between because we realized that we needed to work with all of these different stakeholders. So that's kind of what, you know, um, so a lot of our, um, so a lot of our clients, for example, are, you know, they are CSR foundations, uh, but we do pick and choose who we work with ideologically. You know, we do need to be sort of, they do need to be looking at sustainable development goals and some of those kind of things for us to, you know, want to collaborate with them. I think you mentioned during your presentation that you did not dream big enough and it was one of your three mistakes. How would you overcome your doubts about starting a business? And if you would do sort of life all again, would you invest more resources? Sure. So I did mention this and I, you know, I, I do, um, I, I do feel strongly that if you, you need to be, you need to have a risk appetite to go into business. Um, uh, and that comes a lot from, there's two things it comes from. It comes from, of course, your own personality and your ability to do that. And of course, some circumstances matter. Um, for example, like it, it, it is likely to be harder to go into a business if you have small children that you need to provide for, right? But having said that, there are people who still have small kids and still go into the business because, you know, their risk appetite is that high. So I, I would say risk appetite is important. Like if you have to be able to not have all the answers, and be okay with it. So, you know, going into starting something of your own, you don't, because you whatever it is, how many of books you read, you know, whatever, you know, how many of talks you watch and you go do an MBA, there is still a lot of figuring out that happens at the start for the first couple of years. And uh, there are, again, a lot of mistakes and a lot of learnings, but you have to be okay with not knowing, not having all of the answers. If that is something that gives you a lot of stress, yes, a certain amount of stress, okay. But if it gives you a lot of stress, then it's likely that it's not for you. But if you're okay, you know, going to sleep, like if you're able to sleep at night, knowing that it's possible, you know, because these things are very real. Like you do get to points where you're like, I don't have, I may not be able to pay salaries next month, right? Or I may not be able to pay rent myself next month, or I may not be able to do this next month, or sometimes you're in really difficult conversations like you know um you've had i've had blowouts with like you know where clients have like screamed at me people have like you know not treated me very well or i've had to fire people these are all really uncomfortable awkward things to do but i still have to be okay to do it and still have to be in one sense get a good night's sleep right in the sense that if i'm stressed out yes i do feel stressed but if it, if it get getting to a point where i'm not able to if, if it's keeping me up all night and this is all I'm thinking about, then that's a bit, you know, that's, it, it's, it's a bit difficult. And especially when you're starting out. So you have to be okay with, with uncertainty, a certain amount of uncertainty, be okay with not having all of the answers. And therefore that answers the question of the doubts, right? Like, of course you have doubts, but you're like, okay, let's figure it out. It is a leap of faith. Uh, and, you know, I was okay to not have all the answers at the start and just take that leap of faith. What I would, like I said, you know, what I would do differently was that I still had some doubts, which is why, you know, we, uh, I, I used to think of it, I, I used to think smaller, like, let's do something small, let's do something that's, you know, um, and therefore also something that didn't need a lot of investment in terms of money or time and all of those kind of things. So I think that is something if I had to do this again, that I would do differently, because I realized that if you're anyway pretty unsure and you have to spend the same amount of time working and it's the same, almost the same amount of like worry and stress and and therefore the rewards, right? So then you might as well do that for something big rather than something small because you're anyway kind of putting all of that effort into it, right? So that's that's been my experience. I think that was great advice. Yeah, I know you just have to be okay with not knowing stuff. <laughs> Um, the next question is, are there any entrepreneurs that you are inspired by? Maybe someone that helped you clear your doubts in terms of starting a business? Um, so th th there are, so I, I mean, I follow a lot of stories at two levels. I've, um, so there are sort of the, you know, the big global, big names that I, you know, that I admire, of course, I admire the story of like, you know, Oprah Winfrey and people who've really sort of broken 
out of there was no mold right like there was no uh there was no um before oprah winfrey nobody had done that so and i find that fascinating i love that because you know it's it's great to see people who broken that mold and they didn't follow what you know uh what was done before them uh whether whether the fact that you know also because i personally feel a lot of the a uh, lot of the narrative that exists around entrepreneurship today is very gendered it is very uh, male driven it is very um sort of a certain kind of silicon valley american tech startup driven narrative um so i think a lot of the stories most more of the stories we hear are uh you know steve jobs and apple jeff bezos amazon those kind of stories um so i have always kind of struggled to find stories that i can relate to more right and you know i do and this is a this is this is important to me and this is important to what we do at unlock impact as well is that i do want to see more you know brown women coming out of like small towns all over asia the middle east africa who you know who don't come from uh ivy league schools and colleges and don't have family wealth to put into this what are, how are they building businesses right what are they doing so those are the stories that i am really sort of constantly on the lookout for and the ones that i follow so in that vein um i'm going to share a couple of examples i you know please do look them up because i think they're great sort of role models are uh, they very india specific so you not all of you may have heard heard of them but um one of them is you know is an entrepreneur that i've worked with personally and um, i really admire her her name is rashi narang she runs a company called heads up for tales which is um as the name suggests is a company that um um it 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 sells food products everything for pets and um she's a first generation entrepreneur and she's built this business in the last decade and um it's just wonderful to see how they've grown and you know the thing is that she's also a really nice person right i'm not saying you have to be nice but it's it's a great bonus when someone is also doesn't fit into that entrepreneur mold of like what you think you know being successful is but just that she's really warm and generous and you know someone that i you know someone that i really admire so i know her personally as well so that's you know that's something that's that's a bonus for me and the other the other uh, example that i want to give is uh, so in india there's a there's a website called yourstory.com so again it's one of the things that kind of um, brings together my multiple sort of interests right because it is a media website and it's a media website that was started by a woman called shraddha sharma uh and she started this when uh, people were not talking about startups you know the way like she started this like more than 15 years ago when the word startup was such a odd thing and nobody really understood like you know what it meant to be like a unicorn what startup what startup you know today it's it, it it's aspirational you know but 15 years ago it was actually something that really worried parents right a uh, parents of boys in india would be would have, were very worried when their sons would say that we want to go do a startup because it didn't mean security it didn't mean like a steady income so shraddha sharma in in so in that very male dominated world she started this website uh that focused on basically the stories of entrepreneurship and startups um you know in india and then went on to launch her story which focuses on women entrepreneurs and social story which focuses on social enterprises and today it is one of the top sort of media outlets uh, media platforms in india um they've you know raised several rounds of funding and she is a great role model role model and speaker as well so you know i just love that trajectory because i think she just kind of broke out of the mold and did something in a very tough space so maybe a couple of examples that you guys should uh, check out that's great that's great so just to kind of end off wrap it up what would you say was the most challenging part when it comes to business entrepreneurship starting a business um so there's good news and bad news <laughs> if you're thinking about this um so well the bad news is there are always challenges uh but the challenges change so and i think that is what you know um i also do say this and and you know my business partner and i both say this i think we do have a bit of a uh, attention span problem uh, and i think there are people people go into certain do end up doing certain things because they need a bit of like something you know um so for me it used to be sort of either shifting jobs or you know, changing careers because on the lookout for something and i think with you know with running a business you get all of that in one place right so the challenges don't go away but the challenges change and i think that's where it gets interesting so the first part of it is it's really actually the challenge is your very existence right like does this make sense 
does you know do you want to do this do people want to pay for this like you know um is there a, is there a market out there like those are those are like the very basic challenges you face at that stage um of course you know and that's on the business front and this is apart from the fact that sometimes you have to sort of you know like i said figure out financial like how are you going to manage your finances while you're starting out something until it starts making money or you know all of those kind of things um but the next part is you know the challenges change so you know once you get past that and you actually figure out um that this can work and that people want this and this is a problem you're solving and you know people are also willing to pay for this that's when it gets really interesting right because it's 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 exciting it's it's like okay you can do more you can do better and you also have the benefit of having you know gone through some of the things before in order to do that over there usually the challenges are more of like um people how do you kind of um you know how how, how do you how, how do you keep people connected to what you're trying to do as someone who starts the business yes you're you know always kind of emotionally connected to it uh, but how do you get other people also to connect with it and you know have them sort of you know feel the same kind of connection and passion that you do um also how do you kind of keep them motivated inspired um i would say people the people piece is kind of the harder thing to figure out later on um then there are the sort of more obvious kind of challenges of scale which is that you have to find the balance the business once the business is making money a lot of things become easier but then you know you you need, you want to do other things you want to bring more things in but that i think i mean those are good problems to have i mean those are not really like you know that's just a just just a phase of life it's a good it's a good thing that you're experiencing that so i would say really the challenge changes it just becomes more probably on the people front what it is um which is the phase we are at right now and we'll be there for you know for a little while but i think the most interesting phase is probably going to be at some point what would you know the later stage of the business right which is that um and i and i can see that already happening because as someone who spent 7 years with the business i you, you need to start letting go as well at this point uh, as my team grows and you know we've grown quite a bit we are between two countries we are like almost at like you know 35 40 people so we have a lot of things going on we have multiple business verticals that we manage which means that i cannot be or my partner cannot be you know in charge of involved with every single thing right um and i think that is actually the going to be the next challenge which is letting go and being okay with it so and that is part of the process of growing up in many ways uh growing older and growing up whether as as an individual or as a business person to be okay with the fact that you're you know letting this thing go forth and it will be fine and you know and you will also be okay and you know people will thrive and grow and the business will and it doesn't need you to be involved in every aspect of it i think that's probably going to be the next challenge thank you so much aditi for this fabulous presentation about hearing your life your story the entrepreneurship challenges that you've gone through i think that graph at the beginning of the presentation is making a lot more sense now mm -hmm. thank you to our audience for your lovely interactions and the very well thought out questions if you have any questions please do message me or visit our website www.spunko.com thank you everyone and have a good day ahead thank you so much bye everyone have a nice weekend bye everyone